Hello. Hey. Welcome, everybody. Happy Black History Month. Hey. All right, let's do it. I'm Diana Vega, Civic Engagement Coordinator for DC Public Library. And I want to welcome you to the public square with Dr. Blair L.M. Kelly in conversation with Professor Jennifer Thomas. The public Square series aims to connect leaders and innovators with the public. Through these discussions, we aim to push disciplines forward to new higher level of equity. This program is brought to you in partnership with the DC Public Library Foundation and the Anacostia Community Museum. And we are thankful for the DC, to the DC Public Library Foundation for donating 50 copies of Dr. Kelly's book, Black Folk, The Roots of the Black Working Class. Now I'm going to take this time to introduce our um, moderator and our guest of the honor. <clears throat> Jennifer C. Thomas is an associate professor and journalism sequence coordinator in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film at her alma mater, Howard University. She earned a Master's of, of Arts degree in Journalism from Columbia University a former Scripps Howard Foundation AEGMC Teacher of the Year. She is dedicated to ensuring her students have a successful transition from classroom to newsroom. She is an award-winning broadcast journalism with more than 25 years of experience, notably as an executive producer with CNN, where she served as the 9 a.m. show producer during the September 11th terror attacks. A Fulbright Specialist Scholar, her creative works and published research include the dissection of current practices and pedagogies and journalism, the trans transition from professional to professor, and the complex facets of women, media, and images. Dr. Blair L. M. Kelly is an award-winning author, historian, and scholar of the African American experience. A dedicated public historian, Kelly works to amplify the histories of black people, chronicling the everyday impact of their activism. Kelly is currently the Joel R. Williamson Distinguished Professor of Southern Studies at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill and the director of the Center for the Study of the American South, the first black woman, let's give it up, to serve in that role in the center's 30 year history. <laughs> Dr. Kelly is the author of two books that trace the protests that toppled segregation and the people and movements that challenge the inequities of race and class. The first, The Right to Ride, Streetcar Boycotts and African American Citizenship, chronicles the, little, chronicles the little known black men and women who protested the passage of laws segregating trains and streetcars at the turn of the 20th century. Dr. Kelly's newest book, Black Folk, The Roots of the Black Working Class, begins with this question, what does it mean to be black and working class? Drawing on family histories and continuing into the archive, Black Folk illuminates the adversities and joys of the Black working class in America in the past and present, connecting the everyday lived experience of working Black people to wider discussions of the American working class. Black Folk argues that the history of the Black working class provide a crucial model of how we should engage a wider swath of American citizens in informed citizenship. Dr. Kelly has produced and hosted her own podcast. She's been a guest on several shows, CNN Tonight, and MSNBC's All In, and Melissa Harris Perry's show, NPR, et cetera. She's written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, The Root, and many others. 
And fun fact, tomorrow she will be on MSNBC on Jonathan Capehart's show at 6.30 p.m. Now, I know there's a little something happening tomorrow afternoon. There's a little game in between an Usher concert. Um, but if you have some time, tune in to MSNBC tomorrow and catch Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly received her BA from the University of Virginia in History and African, and African American Studies, and she earned her MA and PhD in History and graduate certificates in African and African American Studies and Women's Studies at Duke University. Now that's the professional bio. I just wanna say, I'm not gonna say I've been stalking Dr. Kelly on social media for a very long time, but I have been a follower of hers on Twitter for years. And so in addition to her scholarly work and accolades, she's a wife, a mother to two children. I know you sing in the church choir. And from it looks like, it looks like you're an amazing cook. If you follow Dr. Kelly on her IG, I wish she had brought us some of that chocolate cake with her on the plane, but that's okay. Um, but I was drawn not just to Dr. Kelly's knowledge, but also her enthusiasm that she had for sharing history, especially on social media, and how she makes it accessible, and her commitment to championing the work and lives of everyday black folk, and how that work, their work, went on to change this country and the world. And so when I saw Dr. Kelly talking about her new book, Black Folk, I was so excited. Um, because my family, my mother is from Selma, Alabama. My great-grandmother was a sharecropper. My grandmother was a nurse. Her siblings moved to Chicago. They're mechanics, worked in factories, et cetera. And I was like, this is a book where I feel like me and my family are finally being seen. And their work allowed my brothers and our cousins to go to fancy schools, to get multiple degrees, to get good jobs. But our story is so many of our stories here in this audience, right? And so I'm really glad that Dr. Kelly has been able to capture um, what we have known and what we have lived but has been left out of the history books. And so in today's climate, when oftentimes people say working class, they mean white, I'm thankful that Dr. Kelly has chronicled and captured the labor and the lives of black folk and that she could join us today to share their stories. So please welcome Professor Jennifer Thomas and Dr. Blair L.M. Kelly to the stage. Thank you. So I'm so excited to be here today and I see one of my former students and the audience and everything is doing big things at Smithsonian. So um, this is a wonderful opportunity to talk with you all um, for Black History Month. And I think what's so impactful is to really know um, a broader version of Black History, one that includes more people. Um, and so I wanted to start by talking about my family. And I really enjoy um, that this work begins with my family. The book begins with my family. They're not extraordinary people in terms of being movement leaders or being names that you might see in a newspaper or uh, folks who were uh, well-educated in a traditional sense. But they were extraordinary in the things that they gave to their community, to one another, and to me. And so oftentimes our histories focus on the great men and now the great men and women uh, that we can chronicle. But I wanted to remind, remind us all that the everyday people are often making history too. So I love calling their names and, and talking about their history as a way for all of us to think more broadly about our own families and our own history. So I am the descendant of enslaved Africans whose presence in this country I can trace back to before the Revolutionary War. I am the descendant of rural black Southerners who survived Jim Crow and were part of the Great Migration. I love calling their names. This slide is of my maternal grandfather, John D. Duncan, 
very characteristically right in the middle, chilling, um, along with his siblings. He was born in a place called Elbert County, Georgia, the same place where his ancestors were held in bondage in the early 1800s. So that's his brother, Obi. If anybody's read the book, Obi is also a character, so he's in there. And then my grandmother is all the way on the end in the yellow. I think they picked yellow as their theme color. I was too little to just know about that, but I had on yellow too. This is a slide of my maternal grandmother, Brunel Rayford Duncan. She was from a place called Newberry, South Carolina, where her family was held beginning in colonial times. Ironically, by people named Blair. That's their last name. I don't think my mother thought that through. This is a slide of my paternal grandfather, Theodore Brooks Murphy. He was born in a place called Accomack County, Virginia, on the eastern shore of Virginia, one of the earliest colonial settlements to hold people in bondage in this country. His family could be traced back before the American Revolution as well. So I, I call that long history for each one of them because I think oftentimes we don't consciously think about the ways in which black Americans are fundamentally American. We think of black Americans as being somehow dislocated from the American experiment, somehow not really being from here. And yet, to be able to trace your family back before the American Revolution would be a common experience if we could all do so. Now, many times the records don't allow you to do so, but that tracing would be there if we could. And so, how could you be more fundamentally American than to be here for the entire experiment. Um, and that's the story of many black Americans, many generations old in this country. This is a picture, I believe, of Solicitor Duncan, uh, my great grandfather. I start the book with his story, and it really is a, a family origin story, a story I heard my mother, my grandfather, and even my grandmother, who wasn't there uh, to experience it. My mother wasn't there to experience it, but it's, it's a story they told me often. It's a family origin story. So I wanna share it with you all here today. The sound of his father's voice at a whisper startled him out of his sleep. On Sundays, John D. loved hearing solicitor's baritone, especially when it reverberated off the walls of the tiny wooden church his father singing until the spirit moved the congregation to shout, even before he began to preach. On weekdays, John D. was also accustomed to hearing solicitor bellow across the wide field, just outside Cannon, Georgia, <coughs> warning him to stop playing the dozens with his big brother, O.B., and get back to work. But that unusual night, when he heard solicitor's voice lowered, he knew things were serious. Even as a rebellious teen, John D. was not in the habit of talking back to his father, but that night there was a particular urgency in his father's tone that made it clear there was no time to ask what was happening. Following directions, John D. packed without lighting the lantern he usually used to illuminate his steps. Muffling his curiosity, he helped his brothers and sisters load the wagon, using the moonlight as their guide. What my maternal grandfather, then only 14 years old, did know that just a few days prior, his father had come home empty-handed after settlement with the white man who owned the land, Solicitor Duncan Sharecrop. Rather than work the acreage itself, the landholder who had inherited the property had subdivided it into tracts of between 30 and 60 acres and contracted with sharecroppers to farm it in exchange for the plot and the fertilizer the white owner would get half the value of the crop. If he'd only provided the land, he would get a fourth. However, that year, the plantation owner told solicitor that the harvest, several massive bales of cotton, had produced nothing but a debt. Indeed, he claimed that after one year of hard work in the fields, solicitor owed him. The owner, who had not even turned over his hands to make the land productive, decided to keep all the shares. 
knowing that there was nothing a black man, even a black man esteemed within the black community as Pastor Solicitor Duncan could do about it. Born there in Northeast Georgia, Solicitor had done this work all his life, breaking the hard red clay to paint the rose, pulling weeds, irrigating the young plants, and then carefully harvesting soft flint cotton from the hard boils until his fingers were numb. Solicitor knew what he deserved. Young John D. had watched his father go over the math based on the market value of the harvest over and over. The cash settlement was essential for the annual purchases his family needed and to his ability to care for his sick wife. <clears throat> as furious as Solicitor was, he dared not speak up. Any public hint of anger, even a calm and measured protest, could result in a lynch mob appearing in front of their home. So when the landowner lied and gave him nothing but a debt against next year's crop, solicitor determined that there would be no next year in that place. He decided to take his family and run. So the story of my family and the story of so many families is interwoven into a black working class history. Now, if I was a good labor historian, a good union historian, I would never be talking about sharecropping, right? That's not where labor happens, right? That's what we're taught in, in graduate school. We're taught that you should be focusing on urban experiences, factory floors, organizing. But to understand the black working class, you have to understand our origins. You have to think about slavery, you have to think about Jim Crow, you have to think about sharecropping to put that in its proper context. And so there are lots of things that are often missing when we're thinking about the way the black working class functions in this country. Missing is the idea of determination, of vision, of making things happen for themselves. We so often frame black people as folks who are in a bad position and therefore weakened in their facility to make new decisions, to make choices. But if we look at black history again through a different lens, uh, not through the lens of capital accumulation, but rather the wisdom, the vision, the wherewithal to survive in spite of, you get a different result. And oftentimes we don't think of black people as critical thinkers. We think that enslaved people were simply victimized, but they were observing the world around them. They were learning. They noticed the value of their labor, of their very bodies at market. They knew how to intervene in those processes on its sides, in its margins, in secret, in conversation with one another. And they used those spaces to build a consciousness that they used in freedom to actualize something different. They understood their place in the wider society and they knew how to take advantage of it as free people. And as free people, they built and rebuilt vital spaces of resistance, grounded in the secrets that they knew about themselves, about their community, their dignity, and their survival. And when you reframe the story of black people in those terms, around their wisdom, around their vision, you get a different kind of understanding of who the working class really are. The other thing that I was taught in grad school is that you needed outsiders to tell black workers how to organize. That you needed some union folks. That the long civil rights movement doesn't begin before uh, white leftists come south. It starts in the 1930s, in the 1940s. That's what you're taught in school. But I found evidence that well before there were white outsiders, trying to help organize black workers, they organized unions. I discovered a union that started in 1866 of black women, washerwomen. They walked into freedom, the very 
next year and organize the terms under which they would negotiate with the city of Jackson, Mississippi around their labor. So it's a reminder that their power, their vision, comes from their own intuitive knowledge of the things they had already experienced. That is, enslaved people who could be bought and sold, they understood what their labor meant. They understood the nature of laundry, something that we take for granted now, but they had uh, a monopoly on because people stigmatized it. So those kinds of machinations of, of the mind are amazing and a reminder to us that the enslaved, that free folk and Jim Crow and suffering under lynching and disfranchisement still had vision for themselves. So I want to talk about some of the professions that I chronicle in black folk. And I started with washerwomen. Um, I am fascinated with washerwomen. I've, there's an amazing book called To Joy My Freedom by uh, Tara Hunter at Princeton University. She's super brilliant. I don't think I would be a historian without the existence of that book. So when I got a chance to work on this book, I was like, oh, I'm going to write about washerwomen. But then I got freaked out because I was like, ooh, what am I going to write about washerwomen? She did a really good job. Uh, but what I discovered along the way, um, with the benefit of technology now in comparison to when she wrote the book or when I wrote my first book, where you had to roll microfilm slide by slide looking for something, now you can search term things. And when I did that, when I put in Negro washerwomen, when I put in uh, washerwomen strike, I discovered that the things she chronicled in her book in Atlanta were incredibly common. That washerwomen across the South and indeed across the nation were organizing and protesting and setting the terms of their labor. And it was pretty, pretty amazing and pretty formidable. Um, when I was writing my book, my editor said something about this being menial labor. Uh, and I was like, ooh, we're not using that word. Because when we look at the work of washerwomen, they are skilled workers. They could make soap. They used refuse from around the community to build the fires. They made their own wash pots. They could make concoctions of clay and chemicals to raise stains from those clothing. They could use a piece of iron. So iron used to be an actual piece of iron for you know, folks who now see like a plastic thing that we, you know, it's quite light. It was a heavy piece of hot iron. The entire thing was hot. They would have to wrap a rag around the handle and they would put it in some coals or a fire and then press your clothes without burning them up. Because I know I would burn up everything if that's how I had to press anything. But they were skilled. They knew how to make white people's filthy things clean. And that skill, that wisdom about how they could organize, that sense of collectivity that they built. They worked alongside one another. They built coalitions. So you see in this image a group of women, a may perhaps a mother and her daughters or cousins or any number of different kinds of groups will come together and lighten each other's load very literally. And that organizing, that coming together uh, had labor consequences for the entire South. And in fact, what I've discovered is the preferences of black women set the terms of that market across the country. The way that laundry was washed was the way that black women wanted to wash it, away from white supervision in their own yards where they could watch their own children and tend to one another and care for one another. And that profound sense of safety and distance that they could at least have in their own yards was meaningful to them. Their resistance in these cases, here you can see the kids in the background, the family, the collectivity, uh, was a collective effort. And that, that coming together had meaning. Uh, they, they were able to build whole worlds, whole neighborhoods off their labor and the value of their labor in a very cash poor economy. I also talk about the Pullman Porters, another group of people who I love teaching about and I'm always excited because they really teach us so much about um, what's transformative, oftentimes by accident. So I'll take one little quick moment to talk about what is a Pullman porter and, and where does Pullman come from. 
Uh, there was a man named George Mortimer Pullman, a pretty terrible industrialist who invented something kind of cool, uh, the, the sleeper car. So when people were using a cross-country train transportation, they had to go to sleep somewhere. At first, they were going to sleep in their chairs, not very comfortable. He invented a car where it could be transformed from daytime sleep, seated seating to nighttime sleeping. And he wanted it to be, feel luxurious. So he thought, well, black men, like a black manservant, like, like in slavery, that, that would feel good. So he systematically hired black men to serve as porters in that space to connote luxury, like you were an uh, old time slave master and this was your manservant waiting on you hand and foot. And so what he intended as racial insult ended up building the largest private employer of black men in the country. And they used that power not just to organize on behalf of themselves, they did. They were you know, really constricted by tips, by long hours, so they fought against those things. But the Pullman Porters didn't just fight for themselves. They used their union to fight for all of us in this country. They used this union to fight for civil rights. Um, a. Philip Randolph came up with the idea of the first March on Washington to desegregate federal employment, um, pressuring FDR to change his mind about uh, black workers in federal jobs during the war. And they also were the, the footstools of making the civil rights movement happen. Uh, their migration, their movement, their knowledge, their organizing became the base of what would become the civil rights movement. Um, and under the motto, service, not servitude, they were more than a union. They were a cause and one of the most powerful organizations in America. So it was, for me, it was a lesson that black workers are always using their collectivity for the greater good. I also talk about um, the black women who worked as maids in households, particularly outside of the South. I looked at the North where my own grandmother, during her migration, she left South Carolina and moved to North Carolina, then moved from North Carolina to Philadelphia. But when she arrived in Philadelphia, she discovered that she could not be hired to do anything other than cleaning. And so she was stuck doing the same work she had done in the South. Um, and so this picture is quite poignant for me. This is actually taken in Washington, D.C. of a woman cleaning a federal worker's home uh, on her hands and knees. Um, I talk in the book about my mother's um, desire to clean the floor on her hands and knees because she, she always told me this is the only way to get it really, really clean. And I thought, well, can't we use a mop? Like, what is happening? And she would perch herself and have her gloves and scoot around on a pillow on the floor. And then I started to discover stories of women who were over and over again told to clean on the floor, not to use a mop. Um, and so the habits that my grandmother built in her about what she had to do became the sort of truth and the unthought truth about um, the best way to clean. She also was really fascinated with china and crystal and fancy dishware. Um, this was all the kinds of things that she saw her mother cleaning and prepping in someone else's home. And she wanted those things for herself. Um, so th the experience of serving as a maid, something I wasn't told until I was an adult. I wasn't told that my grandmother had ever uh, been a live-in domestic in a household, H had to be away from my mom. They, they talked about like her going to work, couldn't do, you know, so it was like pieces of stories. But eventually, uh, the shame lifted and my mother shared those stories. Um, but there should be no shame um, because there was things that were happening to black women, but they were making those sacrifices during the migration to make it possible that family could come, that they could support children, that they could be the, the, the lift for the next generation. And my grandmother eventually got a job at the Philadelphia Navy Yard and could put those things behind her. Um, but at the same time, those, those stories, the things that she suffered, the things that she sacrificed have to be remembered because there are thousands of women um, who are experiencing those same things. 
In fact, there were more women in domestic service in the 1930s and 40s than there had been before the turn of the century because black women were doing that work. Important to note here is that women who still do this work are exempted from federal legislation that provides a base for hourly wages and eight hour work days. And Southern legislators were preventing black women from having these basic rights and protections and we still live in a world where those things are true. The other thing that I noticed is that, you know, this is the time period where we're focused on women's labor and Rosie the Riveter as the iconic image of the woman going to work finally. But what was key here is that Rosie the Riveter had a black maid. Um, the boom in the number of women being hired in those households um, so that women could go to work. We are not talking about, we're not talking about as uh, the national work. We're not uh, rewarding those women with the same kind of pay. And most black women, until there was protest, could not get access to those jobs. So under pressure from A. Philip Randolph of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and Mary McLeod Bethune, 600,000 black women were eventually employed, um, but they were quickly fired from those jobs after the end of the war. Uh, one of the final professions I talk about in the book is postal work. Um, and it's work we take it, it for granted as essentially kind of overly black. In most places you live in urban America, there's gonna be a lot of black people who work at the post office. Most of us have never thought about the journey that postal workers had to take to get access. Uh, but what's important to note here is that postal work is the only working class profession delineated in our Constitution. And three times Congress passed laws to make it an all white workspace. In 1801, 1825, and again in 1828, they said only white men can em be employed in postal work for fear of insurrection for fear that enslaved people who might be doing this work would um, take advantage of having access to the mails and reading and figuring things out. And they were right, because enslaved people were gonna do that. Um, but in, after the Civil War, black men are fighting for their civil right to work in this federal employment. The very first uh, mail carriers, uh, were Civil War veterans, uh, heroes of that fight. And they not only uh, fought for access to those jobs, they also fought to organize and fought to support one another. They too were doing civil rights work the entire time. Um, and it's so important to remember that people were lynched, people were attacked, people were beaten, Ida B. Wells is chronicling the story of Thomas Moss. Thomas Moss was a postal worker. The reason he could buy a grocery store in that city was because he had a decent federal job, and that was a threat. And that threat was seen all over the South. And so postal work was a controversial work. There were places in the South, even in North Carolina where I live, where until the 1950s and 60s under constant protests and activism, black men and women finally get access to postal jobs. So the work that we often think of as easy, black, simple, straightforward, everyone can get a job at the post office, is also a site of struggle. And so the amazing stories of, of thinking about the things that we take for granted are so important. So I am excited to, to here, the questions from our conversation. This is a picture of me and my gram uh, in front of her, in her dining room, which was her favorite fancy space, honey, because she had her glasses and her china and her crystal, um, because she earned it. And she wanted those things for her family as well. So I'm thrilled to be in conversation and then to be in conversation with you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Dr. Kelly, so good to see you. 
Let's, before we get started, um, and I was just sitting over there, so I, ha I was leaning over to look at all the, the pictures, and I know some of you have not had a chance to see this amazing book, but can we please just give another round of applause for this very, very important work that you're doing? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, um, Ryan and everyone here at the DC Public Library for allowing me to be part of this important discussion. I'm very excited uh, for this opportunity. Of course, I am a journalist, so I have notes everywhere. So forgive me, because I have so many questions for you. And part of what you, um, I want to start with how you opened up. Um, so in your book, in your, I want to talk about the development of your book. And something that you said um, I think is very important. You wrote this book, you said, not as an outsider, but as a descendant. And I think that's so important for us to um, talk about how you put your book together in the development stages and as uh, someone whose family, as you talk about from the very beginning, came through this, and as a storyteller. So you weave stories um, of your ancestors while you're educating. Why, and why is it so important to be as the insider and the descendant and not just as the archivist or the historian in general? I think it's, it's quite something. I think it, that was a journey for me. Um, because I am a trained historian, we are taught, you know, they, they, they call it mystery. Like, if you write about yourself, you're just trying to, you know, not really do serious scholarship. And uh, so when I sat down to write this book that I knew my family story was imperative to, I had to remember that my experiences and my ancestors' experiences are also ways of knowing. We so often only uh, validate the archive, but we know that black people have systematically been kept out of the archive. That if my grandmother had taken her diaries to a library to say, I want to contribute them, they would have laughed at her because she wouldn't have been considered someone important enough to capture her story. And so why shouldn't I use the stories that I, I know, if I can verify them, if I can tie them to the archive, the census, the people's wills. And that, that's what I do. You know, I love that work. I love the puzzle of still piecing together a story. But to invalidate their stories is to invalidate black voices. And it's just something I don't believe in. I'm an oral historian. I, I believe in recording and capturing and keeping these stories alive and to make them a big part of how we tell the story of the black experience. That was actually what I was gonna ask you about uh, next, about that, that oral tradition that many of us and in the black community grow up around. And we may not realize that we all are storytellers, we are in that way, uh, can take part in the histories of our families and as historians. How did you get those stories growing up? And did you go back and ask your parents the stories? Were these something that you did as a kid where you were taking notes and I said, Grandma, tell me how, you know, how did that, how did that um, come about it, for you? It was really personally? the opposite. Oh, really? <laughs> so um, my mother was an older parent at the time. Now, not actually old at all. She was 35 when she had me. Um, but at the, time. It, at the time, that was considered, she was the oldest woman on the ward who had a baby. And she was like, and people were like, oh, so glad you could finally have a baby. And you know, very condescending. And so she wanted me to know the world that she grew up in. And she felt like a lot had happened to change uh, in the world in her lifetime. Uh, she went to Howard University here in Washington, D.C. when it was segregated. So she was in a segregated D.C., had to catch a black cab at the train station. Um, and there's only certain places in the city where they would encourage them to go, and you know, certain department stores they could shop in. And, but then also being in the, the world of Howard was so amazing for her to, to meet black people from around the country, around the world in this space. And so it really, uh, as a person who lived in New Jersey and went to an integrated high school, she had to get used to segregation, but she was also experiencing this universal internationalism at Howard and getting such a tremendous education from black educators. So she had this you know, sense that so much was changing in the world in her lifetime. She wanted me to understand her. 
she wanted me to understand that when she was a little girl, there was an ice box and not a refrigerator. And a man <laughs> brought the ice up the steps and <laughs> a piece of ice, and then you caught the water underneath. So she wanted me to, to appreciate the things that we had, the technology and the access we had, and the, and the things that I could do that she could not do. Um, and so she told stories all the time. And I would say, oh, mommy, I know the story. And she'd say, anyway, <laughs> and keep telling me the stories. So every story I heard, I heard many, many times. Um, and close to the end of her life, I was thankful she started to piece together those stories for me in a certain way. She would be like, well, you're a historian. You need to know. Um, and she, she would always tease me about the things I didn't know. I'm like, mommy, how could uh, I? My you have to tell me. <laughs> and so she always, I think she would have been a historian. She always wanted to be a journalist um, because she really was interested. And my grandmother was the same way. Uh, she was avid about the news and about politics. And she told me all kinds of stories about Newberry, about food, about growing her own food, about her garden um, that were essential to her. My grandfather was a huge talker and a showboat, honey. And so he loved telling me stories about where he was, and, and telling you funny tales, and, and um, he was hilarious. He, he, he had this story about smoking that he loved to say, you know, you could have been smoking like a boulder could fly out the mountain and hit you in the head. You could have been smoking a cigarette when it hit you. North Carolina. So, I mean, something's going to kill you. <laughs> and so he just loved, you know, telling funny tales and making people laugh and digging at people. It was, it was really a big part of his personality that I hope to capture a, a small part of in black folk. But they all were always telling me stories. And I'm an only child, so I was never around other kids. I was with them. And so I, I did end up getting so many of these stories imprinted on my heart. And I wanted to just kind of piggyback on that because you grew up um, in North Carolina. No, I grew up in New Jersey, in South Jersey. You're from, you're, okay. Well, you're in Durham, the Durham I live area in Durham, now, but, but you I, were from I grew okay. up in South Jersey. Oh. <laughs> 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 Let's correct that because you know Jersey folks, Jersey. Uh, but I was going to say uh, when we talked earlier, no, uh, being in Durham and in North Carolina now, and I worked there many moons ago and had an opportunity to meet and interview the great John Hope Franklin, yeah. um, and even Chuck Stone, great journalist. Mm -hmm. um, and so you were around these, um, knowing the great historians black historians, and then starting off as a historian yourself. I always like to ask people who are um, truly known for their work. So you know the old, what was the film um, where it was the question was, when did you first fall in love with hip hop? Was that Brown Sugar? I Brown don't know. Sugar. Brown yeah. Sugar. Mm -hmm. So um, was it being around your mother and hearing the stories uh, where you decided, I will love history and this is what I want to do. Or when did you fall in love with history so much so that you knew this is what I would like to do for a career or this is what I'm called to do? I think it's the opposite for me. Okay. I was in high school and I was excited about my history classes because I liked history. And I took the classes and it was nothing like what my family talked about. And we weren't included in any way, shape, or form. And they would mention slavery like for a paragraph here and a paragraph there and say something insulting. And I was like, this is all we get. So I was irritated by the ways in which I was being taught history in high school. And so that's what pushed me to the library. I went to the public library in South Jersey and would spend my Saturdays after my music lessons reading and figuring things out. I, I read Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in high school mm -hmm. because I was like, something else happened in Reconstruction besides what was in here. So I'm going to write that. You, what, you want a term paper? I'm going to give you a term paper. And my mom was like, yes, I saw Du Bois and Howard. <laughs> That's a good book. Read that book. So we, we didn't know what we were looking at or what you know changes it made in the field or any of the historiography stuff. I was trying to figure out what happened in Reconstruction. And so I was interested in history despite um, the limitations of what I was taught and the assumptions that my teachers made about who I was and what my capabilities were. Mm -hmm. um, the day I walked into my AP history class, the man said, well, this is the AP class. And I said, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, you know, I think, and that's, that's part of my personality. I love to, to push past people's assumptions. And so that was when I really fell in love with the puzzle of history and figuring things out because I was mad about the way it was being depicted. 
Well, I want to talk some about some of the themes that, that, that I picked up anyway from that were in the book. Um, collective activism, community, citizenship, um, the role of the church, but in a different way than most of us might, might think. And again, you start off talking with the story about your ancestor Henry, and then we learn about Sarah and the washerwoman. So how, um, how did you go about with all of this collective data that you have now as a historian, um, along with the stories that you heard, how did you come up with those narratives and with all those facts to comprise what would become the chapters in your book? Um, I feel as though there's a way in which this book found me. Okay. Uh, and the, there are things that I figured out and learned on my journey that I probably should never have known. Mm. Um, th this book is bigger than me. Um, I, as I worked on figuring out what was going on in my ancestors' history, so much opened up to me. Uh, things were coming together in ways that they shouldn't have come together. So, so finding Henry, um, that w I've been playing with genealogy and my family tree forever, just for fun, because I'm a history nerd. And that part of my tree never worked. That part of my tree, I could barely get past my grandfather. And then um, one day I started getting like little leaves and I was like, oh, that's interesting. You know, let me see what the connection is. And a breakthrough for me was finding my great, great grandmother's headstone. Um, and it was elaborately carved of granite. It was like the fanciest looking headstone I've ever seen. I was like, well, she must have lived somewhere where there was a lot of granite because for a black woman to have such a fancy stone, it must have just right. been like a wash in granite. And I was like, okay. So then I started looking at the county. I was like, yeah, she's from Elbert County. They have a lot of granite mines. I thought, like, this is it. So then I started pushing into Elbert County, and then I found Henry. Um, and then I found Henry um, in enslavement. I, I'm pretty sure um, tracing, looking at him in the census, he's listed as mulatto, which could have mean any number of things mm -hmm. if for folks who love the census. Uh, just someone looked at you and was like, he looked light-skinned, he's mulatto, <laughs> right. and which I was pretty sure what this, the, the, the issue was with him. Um, so he was that way in the census, but he was, there was also a man exactly his age listed in the, the slave census of uh, a, a man named Rucker who was holding people in bondage in Elbert County. And then I found him registering to vote in 1867, marking an X instead of his name because he was not allowed to know how to write and to read. And then I, I found him in the will of his slave master. His slave master dies before the end of the war. Um, and so he was not bequeathed to his son, but it lists him by name. And that um, was one of the only ones, right? If I remember yes. you said. In the one beginning. of the only names. There was a, like maybe about six or seven names in the will. And his was one of them. And he was listed as a blacksmith. How was that? Just to, not to interrupt you, but what was that moment like for you to see and to discover that? It was, it was quite something. Uh, it was the middle of the night. Uh, again, my good training as a historian tells me that he would not be listed. Um, right. His slaveholder had 100 and some people in bondage. He's not going to name them all, right? And so it's going to be a very anonymous kind of document. And it was 2 in the morning, and it was during the pandy. And I thought, mm, maybe, maybe I'll look at it. And something was like, read it. I could almost hear something say, read it. And so I start reading. It's annoying to read. It's, it's, it's handwritten. I'm reading and reading and reading. And then I see a big, giant, looping H. And I'm like, does that say Henry? Wow. And there he was in the will. Um, and so, I, you know, it was something that my, my smart historian brain told me, don't waste your time. Mm -hmm. And yet, pushing past that, I had probably one of the most important discoveries in the book. That curiosity got, got you there. Um, and I don't know if you want to read any of the excerpts from any of that or if I, c or I can keep going on, but that was just such a powerful moment in the book. Should I? I, I, don't know if I, I know. Let me see if I remember, if I wrote down, because I remember that and I almost was brought to tears by, let me see if I made a note for, and if not, that's okay. Oh, I, I see it. Do you have it? Okay. Mm -hmm. This is good, you guys. Okay. Since you wrote that. 
Although we can't be sure if Henry's skill and his value as a worker allowed him to earn an income as a hired slave, we do know that his position as a blacksmith, blacksmith made him a valuable asset in Joseph Rucker's will. Henry was not freed when his slaveholder died, though some of the wealthiest plantation owners did choose to manumit some of their slaves in their wills. Notable also is that Rucker's will made no mention of Henry's family. It made no allowance for keeping Henry with his wife or any of his then four living children, aged 23, 17, 11, and seven. Instead, his family was counted among the unnamed to be divided up among Rucker's heirs as they chose. Henry was passed down, not as a man with a family, but like a trust fund or antique furniture. The documentation of this horror did not erase his skill, nor did it suffer his connection to his family or the larger community. Joseph Rucker's will would not be the last surviving archival record to chronicle Henry's life, but it was the last that would denote him as property. Given the upheaval of the Civil War, it's difficult to know if Joseph Rucker's documented wishes were carried out. It is clear that when the war ended, Henry and the other men, women, and children owned by Joseph's sons and daughters were given nothing but the clothes on their backs and the opportunity to keep working the same land that they had worked as slaves. Of the fortune in land and money that Rucker left when he died in 1864, not one dollar of it went to those he chose, those he once held in bondage, those whose bodies were broken to build his wealth. There would be no just accounting for the liberated. All they carried into their lives as free people was the community that they built. That was so powerful. And so much of the book is like this. To me, it reads like a novel. But then you're like, no, these are true stories. <laughs> this is truly information um, and true history. One thing else that you talked about that I thought was important that I'd like you to um, expound on a little is that you talk about how um, when black folks moved, we had first had the internal migration prior to the great migration. And you know, I was like, wow, you know, I never thought of it that way because my family, we mentioned ahead of time, I, um, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska, where my late father was born, where his mother was uh, born, they migrated there. So I think about that great migration, because we know we weren't just plopped up in Nebraska. But then, as you mentioned in your book, and can you talk about that a little, about that internal migration that came first after slavery, just to kind of move from there, and we see that it kind of explains how we're all spread out around the country. Yeah, so my, my own family, um, has this way station in North Carolina. My, my grandfather was born in Georgia. My grandmother was born in South Carolina. They meet in Thomasville, North Carolina. Um, my grandfather was trying to get work in the factory there, the furniture factory there, um, but wasn't able to get anything other than janitorial jobs. And so they kept going and they went to Philadelphia. Um, and so that kind of way station is, is common for people to move out of a rural place into an um, urban southern place. It was a place you could get to you know, with very little funds, uh, with a shorter trip. And, and folks are following those family patterns. They're going to where other family members are. They can help them with housing, with jobs. And so we, we can find all kinds of patterns happening, um, moves right after enslavement uh, to urban spaces. Um, my washerwoman moves from Elbert County uh, where my ancestors were from, to Athens, Georgia, for example. Those kinds of moves were quite common. And so people are trying to find their best um, sense of community, of safety, of education for their children, um, all kinds of things that they're seeking first in the South many times. And when we talk about uh, the migration and black folks in our careers, as you mentioned, from Pullman Porters and the Washerwoman, which was, that could have been, a, that, that should be your whole next book. There was so <laughs> much information about that and it was, it was so exciting. But you know, you look at all of these different movements and as you so beautifully say throughout the book that they were uh, the formation of the working class. Um, and when we talk, and you talk about this, if you could talk a little bit more, when we hear the working class in general, most people, as you said, would assume it's just the white person that's making do. Um, but you don't think about black folks and the careers that they had. They were careers for them. And the important work, as you mentioned in your presentation, as the true formation of the working class in America. Yeah, it's, it's powerful 
that you um, bring folks in bondage here to work. They work for generations. They do working class labor for generations. And yet, when you talk about the working class, you never bring them up. They're never part of the conversation. It's really quite powerful. And for me, it's an erasure of that history, of the importance of black labor. Um, and as I was writing this book in the midst of the pandemic, and so many of the people I go to church with, um, people I, who sing in the choir with me, never stopped working. They didn't get to shelter in place. They didn't get to stay home and stay safe. They continued to work. They worked at the post office. They worked at the hospital. They were CNAs. They were nurses. They were, they were never separated from labor. And that essential work was such a lightning bolt of reminder for the country the essentialness of that labor. Now, did it lightning bolt and make people treat them better? No. But I think it did create a consciousness amongst workers themselves about what the value of their labor really should be and the amount of sacrifice uh, that so many people were literally giving their lives to show up to do the jobs that we deemed essential. And if they were so essential, why are they not better paid? Why are they not better rewarded? Why are they not pre prevented from getting sick? Or why are they not given sick time off or hospitalization? So I, I love the way in which that moment called a question. And then our, I believe our generation will be one of the first to have black people at the public fore of starting that conversation to see Amazon workers and those workers really starting that conversation was a powerful reminder of this long history. I was literally just going to say those Amazon workers, as you mentioned, or the ones that were delivering the groceries when we were too afraid to go to the store and fight over the toilet paper, you know. <laughs> um, do you think that, uh, that today that uh, we realize how much agency we have and that the, that the black working class and the working class, do we realize how powerful we are? And, and if not, what, what should we be doing to change that? What was it? You know, one of the talks I had, we were talking in the, uh, on coming up to this uh, event about um, the places I went to talk about my book. And one of the places I went was um, an event at Morehouse that brought HBCU students together to talk about the labor movement. And what was really powerful is when I said, well, how many of your families are working class? They all said, and looked at me. And they're like, oh, we're middle class. Right, exactly. We're middle class. And then I started asking about professions. And many of them were working class professions. But we don't think of ourselves in those terms. And we don't want to be associated with those things. We want to be um, upwardly mobile. And so then students, some of the students began, it was like a table of them who began to argue with me that you know CEOs and C-suite executives were also working class because they work. I was like, well. Jury's out on that, like how much they actually work. And no, like w the term working class has meaning and, you know, it has value for a, a way to think about labor. And so I really had to start at like ground zero to have this conversation with students who came wanting to work for a labor union. And so it was really interesting to the, the ways in which we don't talk about it consciously because we're trying to, to uplift each other and to climb and to you know have more success. But oftentimes, the success can come from the working class. This history reminds us that our success is built on the backs of working class people who had vision, who had a sense of a broader sense of commitment to one another. And so it isn't a win to get away from that history. It's a win to understand that history and our place in it today. Well, I know um, we want to allow a couple, some time for questions, but as, as we go to that and get ready for that, I want to ask you, what's probably been the most surprising thing that you've heard from your conversations that people are learning from, from your book? I, I have been so touched to hear the ways in which people better understand their families and their own history and their own place in that history. Um, so many folks who are like, I never thought about what my grandmother did. Um, one man came up to me after a talk and he said, 
I now know that my grandmother taking in laundry was because she wanted to be there for me. And she raised me and chose a job that would let her do it. So I was never left with strangers. I was never with people I didn't know who weren't kin because she loved me and she wanted to give that to me, um, an elderly man. And that, that was so powerful to hear that he better understood his own life um, by thinking about this long history. And there's so much um, just impactful information that you put in there when you talk about just the power of the washerwoman um, and just how she was, you know, collectively, they were almost feared because they knew they were so powerful yeah. in with, with what they were doing. But um, I'll stop and we'll see if we have, um, would anyone have questions? We have someone. Hi, Dr. Kelly. Uh, hey. Thank you. My name is Hugh. I'm a senior history major at Howard University. Awesome. Um, H-U, you know. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> so my question is a little bit selfish. I'm interested in pursuing a PhD myself. And so I'm really intrigued by your work and how it kind of is aligned with what I'm looking to do. Um, and so my question is, what are some of the scholars that have kind of laid the foundations for your interest in doing this project? Um, you know, is it people like Cedric Robinson? Is it more contemporary scholars, like how, wh what is the story behind your scholarly work on this project? I think my, my pantheon is, is Tara Hunter and uh, Robin D.G. Kelly, um, who I was so thankful, um, both of them were so supportive of this work. They actually were both approached about writing this book before me. So, you know, they tried to get the real, real deal and then they, they were like, well, we'll try this Blair lady too. Um, and so f for me in graduate school, seeing the ways in which they looked at everyday people's lives and turned that into the stuff of history. Just, um, I think both of them really were my Bibles. Their books, I, I would peruse their footnotes like, okay, now how do you know the thing you are arguing here? So I was going back and forth and back and forth and reading all their footnotes. If you read my copy of uh, To Join My Freedom that I had from grad school, it's more marked up in the, the end notes than it is in the text because I was just like, okay, what, what? And I went back for this book. I found um, Sarah used in To Join My Freedom. She doesn't talk about her personal life. She talks about her labor. So she uses that um, really rich interview to talk about the skills that washerwomen have, but she doesn't really trace Sarah her, himself, herself. And so um, it was, you know, still powerful as a guide for me. Um, I think there's some really tremendous histories of the Pullman porters that I use. Uh, there's a, 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 a historian named Philip Rubio who has two amazing books on the post office that I definitely uh, tapped into the way he was structuring that historiography. He's one of the only people who's ever written about the post office systematically as a historian. Um, really understudied kind of area. And so, uh, more in the trenches with the, the, the technical things. Eric Arnson, there's, there's really a lot of really great people who are labor historians, but do it in this broader, non-traditional sense that was so powerful to me. And now we know that Dr. Blair Kelly is among those great historians. <laughs> Would you agree? We have another question. Hi, Dr. Kelly. I am Carla Shedd. I'm a sociologist. And I hear you talk about, you know, your conversation at Morehouse, but I wanted to know how black institutions fared in maybe, you know, sustaining black working class people and perhaps even moving them to mobility. I'm thinking of my people who were at Piney Woods for multiple generations in Mississippi or the Tuskegee. So can you talk about perhaps even doing this work in service to black institutions and how perhaps that's different from doing the work in white households or white institutions and then how it's a you know leaping um, launch pad to greater mobility. I did, uh, none of my um, folks were doing janitorial service to HBCUs. The one space that I did think was quite powerful was looking at um, I'm, I'm a North Carolina Central wife, so I'm, you know, it's like people My think mother I, went there. I, I think um, a lot of people think I, I went because I go to homecoming so hard. 
and I have all my stuff. I have swag. I have like jackets and stuff. But um, my husband went there. But the faculty at North Carolina Central were really essential to the first black postal workers being hired in the city of Durham. Um, it was really powerful to see the way there were professors on campus who were training students to take the civil service exam. And then when they, their students scored very high, they were asking why they weren't hired, pushing. Um, they were being systematically excluded, of course, and so they kept pressing the issue to really prepare students for access to those jobs, which could be life-changing if they had finally gotten them. Um, and so the role of um, HBCUs in pushing those questions of creating consciousness, of serving as a pre preparatory grounds uh, was, was really quite powerful. Um, but the, the interweaving of um, so many of these histories, particularly around the Pullman Porters, the Pullman Porters were some of the most educated black men in the country. Um, they did not have access to other kinds of jobs, so they had working class jobs um, simply because they were slightly better paid. So, um, you know, Thurgood Marshall's family, for example, was in, in, in Pullman work. There's all kinds of folks who end up being at what we think of as the black elite whose uh, ground is built on the story of the Pullman Porters. I mean, the home that Michelle Obama grows up in. Yes, she talks about that yes. quite a bit. And you know, you referenced that in the book too, how, um, and w as we know, during that time, and even through Jim Crow, uh, we, they weren't able to have any other positions. They weren't yeah. able to, they, discrimination was such that they were not able to even be considered for any other uh, jobs. So you have a lot of educated black folks that were doing this work. Did we have um, another? take that rare pr privilege to ask a question because you brought up um, something in your narrative that's also very familiar for my own. Um, my grandparents married here in D.C., met in Arlington, met, married in D.C., and then uh, when, in their words, uh, Roosevelt was starting giving out the good jobs, um, they migrated up to Philadelphia to work in the Navy Yard, um, Italian market, and, and all places to settle in Philly. Um, could you talk about the military um, and where the military fit in whether it's in your narrative, I've also had relatives in South Carolina where each and every one of them, their stories and their generations is built around the army in a lot of ways and how that also helped and hindered in terms of middle class um, in those past few generations. So the funny part is um, when I pitched the story of black folk, I had about four or five more chapters that by the time I wrote all this, I was like, ooh, this is long, and who's gonna read like a 600 page book? No one, um, so let me stop. And so I really ended up tracing the arc of my grandparents' generation through the story. But my, my father is a veteran. Um, he was amongst the generation that was first fully integrated in the military um, because of executive order. And so I have a chapter that's about the military and Navy Yards and the impact of that work around the country on the black working class, uh, which I'm gonna write in another book. Uh, but absolutely, um, the one place where I'm really honing in on the impact of veterans is in the postal chapter, where so many of postal workers um, then and now are veterans. Um, and the ways in which we, we have not adequately thought about postal work as citizenship work um, and the way that we've thought about military service. And yet, it has that history, it has that linkage, um, and, it, and those men and women are making such an impact because of those linkages in the way things are organized and the way that they approach community um, and the ways in which they are disciplined for the larger group uh, in those first generations. It's really quite powerful uh, of a story. That's why I love the picture of William Carney, um, the Civil War veteran. And I, I'm aging myself here. If, if old folks in the room have seen the war movie Glory, um, he's part of that regiment who, um, and he's the flag, he picks up the flag after the flag bearer is shot and killed and gets shot five times um, moving that flag and not letting it drop. Um, and so he's the second black postal worker hired in the United States um, because of his veteran service. 
We're not old if we've seen that film. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's out there. Everybody can see Gloria. But only old people have. <laughs> there we have a qu did you have a question? He's bringing a mic to you. And then we have another behind her. Thank you so much. This has been very, very enlightening. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask, um, as far as advice on um, oral history, uh, Dr. Kelly, um, how do you, uh, do you have any um, helpful hints as to how to get or drag out stories from people who are reluctant because perhaps they're embarrassed about some of their more humble um, professions for, mm -hmm. their, for those of us who benefited, of course, from their sacrifices? So um, I teach oral history. It's one of my favorite things to teach um, to my students. And the, the format that I was trained in that I think really works well is the life history format. So oftentimes we think of oral history being more like what a journalist does, like where you sit down and you get to your real questions and you just start asking those questions out of the box. But that doesn't always work for folks who don't want to talk or are reluctant to talk, as you mentioned. So I always start with their childhoods. My favorite uh, entryway question is, do you remember your grandparents? And oftentimes um, that nostalgia, that softening, that remembrance of you know, things that were enriching oftentimes for many people is a good place to make them, you know, go back in time and give you that longer sweep of their life. And so that they can hear from you that reassurance along the way so that when you get to the harder parts, when you get to the more challenging parts, they're, they're trusting you. They understand why you want to know and what it tells about that longer story that they're weaving together for you. So. Um, I was part of a, a group of, of scholars at Duke University that, that um, worked on the project called Behind the Veil. Um, I that's, remember that. Yeah, it's, it's you know, uh, digitally accessible and a really great resource. I use one of the Behind the Veil interviews in the book. But that life history format that they trained us in um, has been so helpful. Even if you don't want to know all the rest of that stuff, if you want to get to something else, um, just helping people understand that their life is history it's a, a big part of that process and then enables them to feel more confident about the harder things. So that's, that's what I would recommend. Now it's such a small world because when I was back in North Carolina in the, in the early to mid 90s, I did a three part series at WTVD on Behind the Veil and one of my classmates from Howard, um, I can't remember her last name now, Sonia, Dr. Sonia, she was studying for a PhD then um, and that was a big project that was just starting yes. at the time. So Yeah, I went into the field uh, to three historic sites to do Behind the Veil and then I worked in the John Hope Franklin yes. section of the library to open the collection. Yep. Small, when small I was in grad world. school, yeah. Um, I, there are, we have another question for you there. Hi, my name is Ori Yarrow. Um, I'm a Central Grad 2022, yeah. so I was so excited Eagle when you Pride. said that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I also used to work at the John Hope Franklin Center, so oh, wow. I was like really excited right now. Um, I want to talk to you a bit about process. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a historian coming into the field, and so I'm curious about like what your process looks like. What does a typical writing day look like for you? How do you keep yourself inspired? Um, and then a second question, if I may. For folks who are coming into the field, what advice would you give to them? What encouragements or pieces of wisdom do you have to offer? Great. Um, I love writing. Um, you don't have to press me to write. Like it's it's my favorite thing. If you, you were like Blair, you can only do one part of this whole professor life. I was like, well, can, we're just gonna write for the rest of the time. We're good. Um, so I'm I'm always excited to have the space and time. But sometimes you do get overwhelmed. Um, and so some of the, the best advice I've had and that I've utilized is to just take things uh, bit by bit and to really work kernel by kernel. If you find something interesting, you know, just write some thoughts down about it. You don't have to write the real words you're going to write in your book or your dissertation or your project. You can just write a little impression and, you know, keep your thoughts clear from the whatever you read, you know, keep those clear so you don't end up plagiarizing by accident. Um, and, you know, just work, you know, through 
some of your thoughts. And then so as you go back and look at some of those materials, you'll start to see, okay, those sentences I wrote that night, that, that was pretty good. Let me blend that into something else I'm doing. So, you know, take the intimidation factor out of I've got to write the thing and, and just start writing what you think and just start uh, reflecting um, in your own process as you go. And um, honor the time that you like to write and honor the way you like to write. So oftentimes we think, okay, if I'm a serious writer, I gotta wake up at 6 a.m. and like Toni Morrison and go down to the water and right. do the thing. <laughs> and you know, cause I watched her documentary. I was like, oh Toni, if that was how I was gonna, I'm gonna write nothing at 6 a.m. So for me, it, I wrote this whole book between midnight and 4 a.m. Yes. Now that's kind of antisocial and weird but that's when I write, and that's when my brain calms down and stops judging and stops worrying, and I can get words out. Now, I can edit in the daytime, but I cannot write in, in the daytime, not productively. And so I had to stop thinking that that's bad, and that's not the way you're supposed to do it. So just honor what feels good to you, what feels authentic to you, and to be in the practice of writing. Um, write all the time. Write a little bit all the time, like five days a week, write 30 minutes, write 20 minutes, and make sure that you're in the habit of writing. So sometimes when we stop writing, we forget, and then we have to start from like a scratch place. So if you're always writing a little bit, then it doesn't feel so distant and so foreign from you. And so when you have those big pushes, you can go, you can push big, but then if you have those little things, you're, you're keeping your lab open, right? You know, things are brewing all the time. Those are my good secrets. That's good. <laughs> so they say late in the midnight hour. I know. God's going to turn it around. Yes. It's going to work in your favor. <laughs> we have another question. I want to follow up, but I'm going to take the question here. What is, my father passed away recently, and he was a great storyteller um, later on in his life. I mean, he just had so much to say, and I didn't think to capture it until late. And I did capture him like on my cell phone, like just running to the phone and just turning it on at the very last minute of the story. What is the best way to, I guess, document those kinds of things? I have it on my phone, do I transcribe it? What's the best way to do that? Or just digitize it somehow and fill in the blanks as I go along or? So I think there's two things. If what you did capture, you can digitize, you can transcribe, you can write about, you know, whatever is useful for you and your family um, is, is great and valid. Um, and, and, you know, the, the recordings I did with my family members, they're on my phone. You know, I, I teach my oral history class right now. Like, you don't need anything but an iPhone or a, a Samsung to really get out there and be an oral historian. You can set a phone on the table and you can begin that process. Um, you used to have to have like recording equipment and mics and stuff and stuff and stuff. Now the technology has gone so far, we all have that access. So you know that's real work. Don't worry about that. Um, the other piece of it is honor what you already know. Honor the stories you remember um, from folks who have passed away. Go ahead and write down your remembrances of them. Um, those are valid too. Uh, th there's a broader way in which. Uh, we have to begin to honor our memories and our stories um, to verify them with the, the history that we can trace with census documents and other kinds of things. But th th there are still ways of knowing that, that we have to honor and, and think of as important. That was such a great reminder. And uh, my mother, who just passed away in October at 92, the same. I didn't get a lot of her stories until later on. So yes, honoring those memories and those stories is so important. I think there was another, one more question. Okay, this one over here. We have just a couple minutes left. We'll try to get in as. Last question. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, I just want to say we were at the same uh, night for Renaissance in Atlanta. Uh, that was amazing, <laughs> but. <laughs> Um, Were your seats as good as mine? I w yes, I was in the beehive pit. Yes. Okay. Uh, good. <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> I paid a billion dollars for that. Dinner. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> but so my question, I want to harken back to the conversation about essential workers. Yes. Um, it feels like we're in a moment in culture where so much of our identities are 
tied to the work that we do. Yes. And I think on the other side of the conversation about essential workers are conversations about people looking down upon other people who may be bus drivers or postal workers or working class people. And so I guess, so my question is how, do, how, does, your, how, how does your work inform your thinking around ways and practices and boundaries that we can establish with people who want to tie our identities to the work that we do in a way that's, that's born out of shame and not out of um, pride and out of um, joy and out of uh, honoring the histories of where we come from. I think, so there was an incident when I was in graduate school where there was like this, you know, we always break out into debates amongst the graduate students. And one of the debates was someone said in class, well, enslaved people and people in Jim Crow, they were so oppressed that they couldn't think about their circumstances. They were so busy being downtrodden that they couldn't be intellectuals. And I was like, well, that's the dumbest thing <laughs> I've ever heard. So you've never worked. You know, this person probably never really had a job where you did something mindless, where you were just continuing to do something. But I had worked in the supermarket as a teenager, and I, I could scan, and I would not be thinking about anything about the scanning or the food. Um, I was thinking about other stuff. And I realized if you do something where you get mechanized and you know how to do it well and your brain doesn't have to consciously think, turn it over, look for the skew, slide the thing. So I could think about all kinds of stuff. I was thinking about my schoolwork, about what I wanted to do. I was thinking about the other workers. I was a union worker. I was thinking about dues. I was thinking, there's a whole bunch of things I was thinking about at my job. And so I realized that you know, the literature kind of replicated that over and over again, that you know, the, the real work of intellectualism around labor happens from some outsider who comes and informs. And we discount the ways in which workers know their circumstances and they are valuable resources in thinking about how the world should be. And we have to listen to them. So I think that the shame comes because we keep saying your job isn't important, your mind isn't important, your insights aren't important. And we treat people like that over and over and over again. But if we begin to honor their minds, their visions, their intellect, um, it's a powerful conversation. The best place I went on my little book tour was to the SEIU in Chicago. And I was in a room full of caregivers and CNAs and postal workers from the city of Chicago. And boy, that was a generative conversation because they know what I'm talking about and I knew what they were talking about. And it was this uh, synergy of their experiences, their insights and their wisdom in conversation with this history. And so that's where the power lies. And we have to begin to remember that again and again and treat them accordingly. That was so powerful. I think that was, um, I don't know if we have time for any other questions. No, I'm saying we're out, we're out of time. But I think that was a great way to end it. Um, Dr. Blair L. M. Kelly, one description of your book. It's called A Brilliant Corrective in the Black Working Class to the Central to the centrality of the American story. And I think that this book is exactly that. And uh, we're so honored to have had this privilege of talking to you today about this very important work. Let's thank her for her being here again. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <clears throat> thank you. We want to thank Professor Thomas and Dr. Kelly once again for joining us in conversation. Dr. Kelly will be right outside. Uh, right here at that hold counter signing books. So, you know, if you have, I'm not going to say it, if you have other questions, because, you know, Dr. Kelly does have other places to go, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> but, you know, feel free to get your book signed and chat. And we just want to thank you again for coming and sharing all of your insight with us. So let's give it up one more time. Thank you. And thank you to all, you all, for joining us. <laughs>